Well, thank you for coming to today's seminar. Um, this presentation here was inspired by a recent trip that I took up to Vancouver, uh, where I was invited by the Simon Fraser University Department of Statistics to give a statistical research seminar. And uh, while that is an honor, and I was looking forward to meeting the faculty there, I have to admit, though, that I was actually looking forward to my visit more so for another reason. This reason was my favorite TV show, Battlestar Galactica, was actually filmed, at least partially, right there on that campus. So when I had some free time when I was visiting Simon Fraser, I dragged my faculty host around with me from site to site to site on campus, visiting these places where the show had been filmed. So for example, here is one place on the left where I actually took a picture of it. And on the right, that's how it appeared from a slightly different angle on Battlestar Galactica. So this whole trip then got me thinking more about how science is often used to solve sci-fi problems. What I mean by that is on sci-fi TV shows, uh, movies, and in books. So often you see science as the tool that's being used to rescue characters from the brink of disaster. Well, why couldn't the type of science that's being used be the statistical science? You know, why not? So today what I'm going to do is talk about one specific problem that occurred on Battlestar Galactica and how the statistical science could have been used to solve that problem and perhaps even dramatically change the course of the TV show. Now, before I get too far here, I'd like to ask all of you a question. And that is, who is a Battlestar Galactica fan? All right, so we've got a few. <laughs> I think maybe a few of you also are maybe a little bit shy. You don't want to admit in front of your colleagues that you watch Battlestar Galactica. That's OK. How many of you have at least heard of the TV show? Okay, so good. We at least have a few more. Well, I had anticipated that not a whole lot of you would have been Bowser Galactica fans, so I have come prepared with a short video. <laughs> <laughs> so you all get to watch it. Um, anyway, th this video is actually the, uh, the intro to every Bowser Galactica show. And it tells you, well, what is the story about? Pay special attention in the video to these things called Cylons, because they're going to be pay, playing a very important role in this particular presentation. So let me get out of this. And I apologize if there's any feedback here with the speakers. So I was having some problems with it. And let's go to the video. Previously on Battlestar Galactica. Oops, sorry. Let's actually start over there. <laughs> okay. Previously on Battlestar Galactica. Okay, so they have a plan. Let's get back to the presentation here. So I'm going to summarize what you saw in that video and also give you a little bit more information about what Balsar Galactica is. Let me actually mute that. Okay. So Balsar Galactica is set in a distant, far-off corner of our galaxy where humans live. These humans develop things called Cylons. And these silence are cybernetic life forms. And originally they were created to be servants for the humans. Well, these Cylons eventually evolved on their own and rebelled against the humans by destroying the humans' home planets. In the end, only about 47,000 humans actually survived the attack by the Cylons. And they all banded together in a ragtag fleet of spaceships trying to get away from the Cylons. 
Now, the fleet is led by a military Battlestar spaceship named the Galactica, and thus that's where the name Battlestar Galactica comes from. In the video, you saw two different kinds of Cylons. The first kind is a Centurion. So you can see it's this kind of metallic-like robot. Well, again, these, and this was what was originally created by the humans. These Cylons evolved, though, to a new humanoid form. This was originally unknown to the humans that this new form of Cylon existed. And this is what led to the almost complete destruction of humanity. Early on in the TV series, the humans find out that this new humanoid form of a Cylon now exists. And so a very important question for them to answer was, well, how can you distinguish a human from a Cylon? Well, the leaders of the fleet ask a scientist by the name of Dr. Gaius Baltar to develop a Cylon detector. Fortunately for him, the number of Cylons in the fleet is expected to be small. But there are 47,905 individuals in the fleet, and they all have to be tested to determine if they are human or Cylon. Well, a few episodes after Baltar is asked to develop a Cylon detector, he does develop one. And in season one's Tie Me Up and Tie Me Down, you see Baltar in his laboratory. And he's surrounded by many, many, many different blood specimens. Each of these blood specimens then are used by the Cylon to detect, detector to determine human or Cylon. And you can see in the caption, it says, A frustrated Gaius Baltar contemplates the immense workload ahead of him as he prepares to test key fleet personnel with the Cylon detector. Now, just to emphasize the, the immense workload that he does have ahead of him, I'll give you a little bit more uh, information about the problem that he faces, I have another short video. So let me fast forward here. Okay, and I'm going to turn off the mute. And here we go. A mortal one, I'm afraid. It's not that bad as it goes. Forty-seven thousand nine hundred and five blood samples. Eleven hours to test each one for silent indicators. No, that'll take a while. Twenty-one thousand nine hundred fifty-six days. Sixty-four thousand five hundred and fifty-four years. Well, let's figure in a few hours of sleep here and there. We'll call it an even sixty-one. Sure. Come on, Dr. Dog. I will say. Tune in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's hard being a genius. Yes. Okay. Is that too low? Could you hear it? Okay. The speakers in this, in, the, in this part of the room don't work, so that's one thing that's complicating things here. Well, let me summarize a little bit what you saw then. Um, so there are 47,905 blood tests that need to be done. They each take 11 hours apiece, and that translates into 21,956 days, or 60.1534 years. On a side note, they happen to have 24-hour days and 365-day years, too, in the Balasar Galactica world, too. <laughs> kind of an interesting coincidence. Anyway, though, um, okay, now, well, how is he planning on doing the testing here? Why is it going to take so much time? Well, he's planning on using something you could call individual testing. Where Commander Adama, are you a Cylon? Well, using his blood sample and the Cylon detector, going to be able to get a positive or negative test result back. Leah Dama, his son, are you a Cylon? Again, a positive or negative test result. And 
Baltar could keep on testing other people in the fleet as well and get positive or negative test results. There are obvious problems with this testing strategy. It's going to take a lot of time, 60.1534 years. Also, it's going to take a lot of resources because of all the testing that's, that needs to be done. They have very limited resources in the fleet because these people were fleeing for their lives trying to get away from the Cylons in the first place. They didn't have time to pack up a whole bunch of supplies with them. Now, what Baltar needs is a way to determine human asylum for everyone such that it takes a small amount of time and takes a small amount of resources. Now, often on sci-fi TV shows like this, um, writers hire a consultant to help them merge the sci-fi world with the real world in a believable way. Unfortunately, the writers of this TV show did not ask me to be their scientific <laughs> consultant. Because I would have told them, no, 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 no. You don't want to do individual tests. That's not how it's done in the real world. What's done in the real world in similar situations like this is to use something called group testing. Here's how group testing would work. Well, I have these blood specimens from these four different people. How about we take a little bit out of each of those vials that contain the blood, put them into a single container, mix it up really, really, really good, and from that, get a pooled test response, positive or negative. Do that for those four people, do it for these four people, do it for these four people. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if a group is negative, and that says all four individuals are not Cylons. And so notice it only took one test to determine that four people are not Cylons. Where with individual testing, well, it took four tests to determine that four people are not Cylons. Of course, though, if the group is positive, well, then it says at least one of the four individuals is actually a Cylon, and there are various retesting procedures that can be used to determine who is a Cylon and who is not. We'll spend some time talking about those coming up. Now, this group testing idea works well when the prevalence of a trait, such as being a Cylon or not, or in the real world having a disease or not, when the prevalence of the trait is small, it works well. Because if the prevalence of, a, of the trait is large, then you're in danger of having a lot of groups testing positive and having to do a lot of retests to determine who's positive and who's negative. Apply to the correct situations, group testing can uh, uh, result in an immense time savings and also save resources because overall, less tests will be done. Now, of course, group testing is actually used in the real world and it's being used right now in many, many, many different places. Here are a few. Group testing is used for screening blood donations. Of course, it's important to keep our blood supply free of disease. And so the American Red Cross will test blood donations for a variety of different diseases. I think it's about 10 or so. And the way that they do their testing is through group testing, using groups of size 16. The reason why they have to use group testing is because they have to screen 6 million blood donations a year. That's a lot. And something that's very important right now dealing with influenza, there's been some recent research done about, well, could group testing be used for screening blood donations for influenza? In fact, that paper shown there talks about how it can be done uh, specifically, uh, the test case was with the German Red Cross. And yes, group testing does work well. Group testing is also used by pharmaceutical companies for drug discovery experiments. In this particular setting, uh, these pharmaceutical companies need to screen hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds to look for potentially good ones that are active, that are going to maybe cure a disease in the end. This is before clinical trials even start. And one, often what they do is use group testing to screen all these chemical compounds. Great recent paper on that is by Katja Remlinger, uh, corresponding to her dissertation at NC State and then uh, her paper there. Group testing is also used by plant pathologists, where the purpose is to do a multiple vector transfer design experiment to estimate the probability an insect transfers a pathogen to a plant. Like one of these white back plant hoppers there you see feeding on a plant. We want to know what's the probability it's going to transfer a pathogen to a plant. 
a great recent account of this is in Shaw et al.'s, et al's paper, where they actually implement some of my research to do their estimation. Group testing is used in a variety of veterinary applications. One in particular is with the bovine viral diarrhea virus in cattle, where groups of up to size 100 have been used. And they pull ear notches of the cattle. It's a lot easier to get an ear notch than it is to take a blood sample uh, from cattle. Also, testing's actually, group testing is actually being done right here on campus at the Vet Diagnostic Center, where they test for a variety of different diseases there. And lastly here, uh, group testing is used in some places in relation to what's called the Infertility Prevention Project. This is a CDC nationally implemented uh, program here whose purpose is to assess and then reduce the prevalence of chlamydia and gonorrhea in the United States. The state of Nebraska and every state participates in this program. And in the state of Nebraska, testing is done at the Nebraska Public Health Laboratory up in Omaha. And they have to screen about 30,000 individuals there per year. And each of the tests costs about $11 or $16, depending on what kind of test is done. Right now, though, they are using individual testing. Maybe in the future, some, with some of my work, this will be changed. OK. So let's talk about four different ways that we can um, four different retesting procedures that can be used to determine who's positive and who's negative inside a positive group. The first procedure is one that was originally proposed by Dorfman way back in 1943. What he wanted to do was screen American soldiers during World War II for syphilis. And what he said to do is that if you have a positive group when you're doing this group testing, why don't you just simply retest everyone in that positive group to see who's positive and who's negative, who contributed to that overall positive response. So that in the end, if you have a group of, let's say, size I, you either have one test if the group originally tested negative, or I plus one test if the group tested positive. This is what the American Red Cross uses with their groups of size 16. And this is actually the most implemented procedure out there for retesting. Sterrett came along in 1957 and said, well, let's do something a little bit differently here. When you find that positive group, why don't you individually select people in that group and retest them until you find the first positive. What I mean by that is shown here. So here's one of these groups of size 4 that we saw earlier. Notice I put the actual true responses here. Oops, let me bring out my pen color. That group would test positive. Okay? And so Sterrett would say, well, why don't you randomly choose an individual in the group? Let's say I choose Baltar, retest him, he comes back negative. Okay? Well, we still haven't found the cause of that positive group. So let's randomly select another person in the group. Let's say Sharon here. Well, she happens to be a Cylon. So there's my first positive. Then regroup the remaining individuals and test them. If they test negative, which is what would happen in this particular case, you're done. That's it. If it tests positive, though, well, then you're going to need to follow the same idea over again. Randomly select an individual, retest them, and so on. Okay, the third retesting procedure that we're going to talk about is one called halving. Simply, if you have a positive group, why don't you divide it into two equal halves and then retest individuals in those two halved groups. If any of those groups come back positive, well, divide it in half again and keep on going. So if I have a group of size 8, let's say, that tests positive, then we would divide into two groups of size 4 retest them. Suppose we get one positive and one negative. Well, I'm going to redivide that group of size 4 into groups of size 2. Suppose I get a negative here, a positive here, and I keep on going until I test individually, and there we go. I found the cause of my positive group. It just happens to be one individual. So having Dorfman and Stair procedures are often referred to as hierarchical procedures. Because as you can see, at least in that tree diagram, how we proceed kind of in a hierarchical manner. Do something once, 
let that decide what we do next. There are non-hierarchical procedures too. One is matrix pooling. This is how matrix pooling works. And uh, this is actually what Bowen talked about um, in his seminar last spring, if you were here for that. And this is uh, some of his slides. With matrix pooling, what you can do is arrange your specimens into, let's say, rows and columns, like a grid. And in a real setting, what you might have is a plate with wells in the plate, and you have specimens inside the plate. Then pull by row and pull by column and do group tests. So for example, here I would pull these individuals and I got a positive response. I pull this column, get a positive response. All the other rows, all the other columns in this diagram were negative. Then the positive individuals that cause those positive responses are at the intersections of the positive rows and positive columns. So in this particular case, there's where my positive is. Of course, there may be times where you have more than row, you might have more than one row, let's say this one, and more than one column test positive. Then what that ends up meaning then for you is that the positive individuals that cause those positive responses are among those four. It's going to be at least two of the four. And to find that out, then, what you can do is just do some retesting, then, of those individuals. Great recent account of this was in Kim et al.'s uh, paper, which, again, corresponds to her uh, dissertation at uh, UNC Biostatistics. Let me bring out my red pen again. Okay. In order to actually implement these procedures, you might have to actually do some modifications to them. So, for example probably you should never declare an individual positive without actually testing them individually. So for example, with that matrix point example, when we had one positive row, one positive column, that told us who was positive. Well, what happens though if you had testing error that you had to deal with? Meaning maybe one of those rows was a false positive. So the test gave you the wrong result. Well, you should probably still, before you declare that person positive then, maybe actually do one test on them just to make sure that indeed that they are positive. Well, you can use having with a group of an odd size two. If you have a group of size seven, well, split in a group of size four and a group of size three. You can use unequal group sizes across your entire population of individuals that you're testing. So for example, if I had uh, 92 individuals, I want to use groups of size 10, well, just to use nine groups of size 10, one group of size 2. And lastly, with matrix pooling, suppose you have easy access to a, a way to do a 10 by 10 grid of tests, but you have 122 individuals to test. Well, do a 10 by 10, do a 2 by 10, do Dorfman on the remaining two. Okay, now that we've gone through the statistics part here, let's talk about how we can use these statistical procedures for Cylon detection. Since the TV show series has actually concluded, concluded back I think last March or April, we actually know who is a Cylon and who is a human. So we know that there were 7 out of 47,905 individuals at this time of the show that were Cylons. So we know the overall true prevalence, let's call it P, to be 0.0001461. So it's like we know what the population parameter is in this particular setting. To help you understand that prevalence there and compare it to a real life example, with the American Red Cross blood note donations in 2001, HIV prevalence was just a little bit smaller than that. Again, notice how small those prevalences are. That's why group testing is a great procedure to use in these kinds of settings. Now, in order to evaluate these retesting procedures, we're going to look at the expected number of tests, meaning on average, how many tests would you expect it to take to do this, the decoding of 47,905 individuals into human or Cylon responses. So we're going to look at the expected number of tests, and we want that to be small. Smaller number of tests, less time it's going to take, less resources are expended. Now, to give you an idea of how the expected number of tests would be done or calculated, let's take a look at Dorfman's procedure because it's the easiest. Suppose we look at one group, and we'll just in general call it group K. 
with Dorfman's procedure, you're going to test the group first. Okay, so you have at least one test. And then if the group tests positive, you're going to do, let's say, I sub k more tests, where I sub k is the group size for that particular group. And you do those additional tests with a probability of 1 minus 1 minus p raised to the i power. That would be the expected number of tests for one group. We want to know across all groups then what the expected number of tests is, so we'll just simply add that up for, let's say, capital K different groups. You can do similar derivations, too, for the other three procedures, but they are a lot more complicated. You can see Kim et al.'s paper for that if you are interested. Now, when Baltor was doing his testing, he was making some assumptions. Now, I'm going to follow those assumptions as well here. First, testing can only be done back to back, meaning he does one test, waits 11 hours for the test results, gets the results, does another test, waits another 11 hours, and so on. If he could run multiple tests at the same time, of course, that would take a lot less time overall then. But he only does back to back testing. Um, I don't know why. Uh, my, my theory is it's probably because he has limited resources. Because it actually took a nuclear warhead for him to actually construct the Cylon detector. And they didn't have a whole lot of nuclear warheads with them on the Galactica. Um, also, Baltar never discusses the possibility of testing error. I briefly mentioned testing error earlier. Again, testing error occurs when, let's say, your diagnostic test says positive, when in fact it should have said negative, or vice versa. But Baltar is actually considered to be a genius, so maybe he actually did construct a Cylon detector that had no error at all. I'll make that same assumption here. But usually in the real world, one needs to account for testing error, and we will discuss what would happen if one did do that later on. Okay, let's take a look at this plot now. This is a great plot. On the x-axis, we have group size, and it goes from 10 to 500. So I'm going to try these retesting procedures with a group size of 10, and actually, I'm going to go in, in, in sizes of, of 10 here. So 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 500. On the y-axis, I plot the expected number of tests that that retesting procedure would take. And then I translated that expected number of tests into a year's length of time using the fact that it takes 11 hours apiece for each test. Remember, Baltar says 61 years it would take for him to finish testing. Notice what the highest value is on that second y-axis there, 6. Let's look specifically at one example. So with Dorfman's procedure, if we look at a group size of 80, and if I project up into my plot to where I hit the Dorfman red line there, and then project over, I come to a number of tests of 1,150 it would take, not 47,905, which would have happened with individual testing. And if I keep on going then over to the other side, if I could draw a straight line, that would be 1.45 years. A lot less than the 60.1534 years that Baltar was going to take. Now, if you look at all the different methods there, represented by Dorfman, Sterrett, having, and matrix pulling, you notice the green dashed lines are typically below everything else. That corresponds to having. So what that means then is that having would be the best in this situation as it lowers the number of tests that it will actually take the most. In the end, for a group of size 500, the minimum number of tests results there will be 220 tests in only 101 days. That's it. If you were able to extend out farther that x-axis, you would find that having actually reaches a minimum of 172 with a group size of 4,080 overall. Another thing that this plot gives us, if you haven't seen this already, is a way to determine well, what's the optimal group size that's needed. This, the group that will give us the smallest expected number of tests. Well, since P is known, we can actually calculate that. So we can see for Dorfman, the minimum would be 80. For Sterrett, minimum would be about 120. And then for matrix pulling, be about 220, and we already saw what it was for having. Now, in the real world, though, when you actually use group testing, you're typically not going to be able to use, though, optimal group sizes. The reason being is because you won't know what P is. You know, that's why I was able to calculate it here, because I know how many Cylons there are. 
Also something that you have to worry about in the real world is something called a dilution effect. Meaning that as you increase your group size, you're putting more and more and more and more individuals in, into the group. So each individual's contribution to the group is less and less and less. In other words, their effect is diluted. And that dil dilution effect may become so extreme that the diagnostic test that you're using can no longer pick up when a positive occurs. So groups of size 4,080, well, while that might be optimal, probably might not be able to be used in the real world. Also, optimal group sizes can be chosen on other, or using other measures. You know, could cost. You know, how much in labor, how much in storage will it cost to do group testing? You know, it might cost more to store the specimens because you have to store them in case retesting is needed. Also, there's questions about practicality for some of these procedures, too. You know, if a lab tech is actually running the test in a laboratory, well, can they necessarily do some kind of complicated procedure without the possibility of creating an error? So, so far we've been focusing on expected number of tests. But of course, the expected number of tests is not going to be equal to what would actually occur if you were to use one of these group testing procedures. The actual number of tests. If you were to go out and actually do it, you know, the expected value is not the same as what would be observed as the number of tests. So we need to actually account then for the variability that would occur from one application of this for one problem to the another application of this to another problem. How can we do that? Well, let's use Chebyshev's theorem. So we take the expected number of tests plus or minus three times the standard deviation of the number of tests. And what we'll get is a range where we would generally expect all the observed number of tests it would take. If for some reason I could apply this procedure multiple times, how many tests it would take should fall within that range, generally speaking. So applying this then to the Cylon detection problem, we then get another plot. This plot is done on the exact same scale as what we saw previously. Now I have two lines on the plot for every procedure to represent the lower bound and the upper bound for those procedures. So for example, with um, let's say if I did a group size of 100 and did Dorfman's procedure, I would expect, generally speaking, my number of tests, any time that I would apply this to a similar situation, to be somewhere between 500 and about 2,000. And you can see overall, Dorfman and Steris procedure have a lot more variability that you have to work with. It gets a little bit uh, more reasonable for towards the optimal group sizes, but there is more variability in comparison to having and matrix pooling. And look how close those bands are for having a matrix pooling. You're going to have a lot more certainty in the what the observed number of tests would be for this particular situation. So with a group size of 500, number of tests would be about 127 to 314. Time, 58 to 144 days. Again, a lot lower than that 60.1534 years that we saw earlier. Okay, let's talk about some additional considerations that uh, typically need to be made when one is doing group testing. Again, one needs to account for testing error. An incorrect diagnosis. Um, you know, you should be a, a negative when in fact the test gives you back a positive or vice versa. What happens then in the, uh, when one applies group testing to a situation where there's testing error? Well, typically you're going to have to run confirmatory tests just to make sure that if I say Commander Adama is positive, you know, before I tell everyone else in the fleet that he's a Cylon, I better make sure that I better retest him one more time. So I'll do a confirmatory test. Also, something you have to really worry, worry about in group testing is false positive groups. You know, these retesting procedures, they do the retesting when they have a positive group. So if they have a false positive group, and then you do the retesting, well, you basically just wasted your time because you wouldn't really need to do the testing because it was a false positive group. Everyone inside that group is human. The way then that we can measure testing error is through measuring, let's say, the diagnostic, let's turn the other way, diagnostic accuracy of the procedure. And we can look at the in, in, uh, a particular test sensitivity and a particular test specificity. So test sensitivity would be defined as a conditional probability. Given positive is the true outcome, 
what's the probability that you're going to actually find out yes it is a positive specificity then is another conditional probability given true negative what's the probability the diagnostic procedure is going to say it is actually a negative so with the silent detection problem suppose we use Dorfman's procedure sensitivity and specificity of 0.95 so we have 5% chances of the, the different kinds of errors then. and we'll use a group of size 80 look what happens to the expected number of tests now up to 3500 where before without testing error it was 1150 but still remember there are 47,905 individuals so still Dorfman's procedure is going to really reduce the number of tests that you're going to have to run even if you have to worry about testing error well why do we see this jump though well the jump is due to the possibility of false positive groups because any time so there's going to be false positive groups since that specificity is 0.95 Anytime you have a false positive group, that means that you're going to do 80 more tests on that group when you don't really need to because everyone is human in it. Also with testing error, there are other ways that one should measure how good a particular group testing procedure is. And that is to look at what's called the pooling sensitivity and the pooling specificity. This is different from what we just got done talking about. This is the overall conditional probability of group testing procedure gets the correct diagnosis. Meaning, for example, with Dorfman's procedure, if I'm testing Commander Adama in a particular group, well, in order to declare him to be a Cylon, I would first need his group to test positive, and then I would need him individually to test positive as well. So it would take actually two tests with him. So we can look at then the overall pooling sensitivity, overall pooling specificity, and to measure the overall accuracy of a particular procedure. With Dorfman's procedure, the test sensitivity is simply SE squared. Remember, it would take two tests, each one with, let's say, a sensitivity of, we'll just call it S sub E, just take two tests to determine someone's positive. The pooling specificity, though, is a little bit more harder to calculate, a little bit more of an ugly result there, but that's what it would look like. Now, in general, pooling sensitivity for a group testing procedure is typically always going to be lower than the test sensitivity. The reason why that's important is because if I were to do individual testing, I would only have to worry about this, the test sensitivity. But don't worry. What one can do is actually include retests of negative groups then to increase the pooling sensitivity, and you can get a pooling sensitivity that is actually greater than um, S sub E. With group testing procedures too, pulling, <laughs> pulling specificity is typically higher than the test specificity. And that's because multiple tests need to be, uh, multiple tests need to be done to diagnose a positive individual. Okay, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the estimation of the overall prevalence P. Oftentimes in group testing, you want to do that in addition to determining who's positive and who's negative. In other words, you want to estimate a proportion. In some applications of group testing, though, that's all you're interested in. You don't care who's positive and who's negative. For example, in that plant pathology example that I talked about earlier, you don't care which insect is actually transferring a pathogen to a plant. You just want to know what's the overall probability of transmission by these insects. Now, in the Battlestar Galactica problem, of course, we do want to know who's positive and who's negative, who's a Cylon, who's human. But perhaps, Balter was using, let's say, Dorfman's procedure, and he wanted to estimate P after an initial set of group tests. So maybe he uses Dorfman procedure, groups of size 80. Gets the group test results back and then stops and says, okay, Let's use those results to give me an overall estimate of what's the prevalence of Cylons in the fleet. That will help them determine, well, how bad is this Cylon problem anyway? So, to estimate P, then we can come up with a maximum likelihood estimator for P. Let's call it P hat. And one can write out the likelihood function to do that. And simply all this is, is a product of a bunch of Bernoulli's. Where here is the probability a group test positive. Here is the probability that a group test negative. Then these Z's here correspond to, is it a positive response or a negative response? 
Typically, you're going to have to use numerical maximization, maximization methods to actually get the maximum likelihood estimator here. However, in the special case where you have equal group sizes, well, the maximum likelihood estimate can be found just to be that. 1 minus 1 minus the number of groups that test positive over the number of groups. That whole quantity raised to 1 over the group size power. That's it. Then using regular old maximum likelihood estimation methods um, or related procedures, one can find the estimated variance by taking one over the observed Fisher information. Use that then with a quantile from a standard normal distribution. And then you get a walled confidence interval for P. So you can say with a certain level of accuracy, P is between two different numbers. Well, let's try that then with the with Bowser Galactica example. So I'm going to randomly put people into groups and then observe the number of groups that test positive. Here are my results. Let's focus in on a group of size 5. When I did this, I found seven groups that tested positive. Using then my maximum likelihood estimator, p hat, I come up with an estimate of 0.0001462 as my estimate for p hat. Remember what P was. 0 0.0001461. Wow, that's pretty good. I can also calculate my standard deviation, my confidence interval, so I'm 95% confident that the true value of P is within those numbers. Well, since again the Bowser Galactica series has ended, we know what P is, and guess what? P happens to be within our confidence interval. You can look at these other group sizes too, and notice how these estimates for up to 100 are all pretty close. 0.0001461. Again, think about what this means then. With a group of size 100, I've used 100th less tests to actually do this group testing than I would have to do with individual testing. And I still get a pretty good estimate. When you have larger group sizes, well, you know, you do have a little bit more deviation from the true value of P, but really, it's not that bad overall. If you did other random groupings, you're going to get very similar results because there's only seven Cylons out of 47,905 individuals. Okay, so some conclusions. Well, what if Baltar would have used group testing on Balsar Galactica? Well, by my best estimation, I think testing would have concluded sometime during season number two out of four. Now, why is that important? Well, it took until season four on the actual TV show before we know, knew who all the Cylons were. So perhaps this would have some stifled some of the fans' enthusiasm for the show. Um, I don't know. Also, something that's important to realize is that some of these Cylons were actually in high-level positions in the fleet. In fact, one of the Cylons was second in command of the Galactica. Fortunately, though, he was a good Cylon. Yes, good Cylons do end up existing, so good. And they help lead the fleet then to their ultimate destination while they were trying to get away from these Cylons, the ultimate destination of Earth. So, now perhaps I made some of you Bowser Galactica fans during my presentation. <laughs> Again, the series is done. But, you know, put it on your Netflix queue. Go to Hulu.com, go to Sci-Fi, you can get some episodes there. There is going to be a new May for TV movie coming out called The Plan in November, which talks about the plan that the Cylons had for the initial attack on the humans. And episodes are available on DVD and Blu-ray. Yes, <laughs> thank you for bringing that up too. Um, also, there is going to be a new series. It's a prequel to Battlestar Galactica called Caprica. And it's going to premiere in 2010. And it's set about 50 years prior to the Bowser Galactica timeline. And it's going to explore some topics such as, well, how do humans first develop these Cylons? With this new series, though, it makes me wonder, well, maybe the statistical science could have been used in the first place to prevent the Cylon attack. Well, let's hope that the writers of the show will be talking to some statisticians to help them in their writing. That's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions?